Chapter 18. Air Pressure and Wind Atmospheric pressure is the force exerted by the weight of the air above. The weight of the air at sea level is about 14.7 pounds per square inch, or 1 kilogram per square centimeter. This decreases with increased altitudes. The higher you go up, the less air atmospheric pressure on you. The units of measurement? It's in millibars, which are MBs. Standard sea level pressure is 1,013 0.2 millibars. Okay. In inches of mercury, the standard sea level pressure is 29.92 inches of mercury. Now the instruments we use for measuring atmospheric pressure is a barometer. A mercury barometer was invented by Torricelli in 1643. It uses a glass tube filled with mercury. Okay. So as air pushes down on this plate, it pushes up mercury through this, this tube, and you measure the height that the mercury goes up the tube, and that's 29.92 centimeter, um, inches. An aneroid barometer is without liquid. It uses an expanding chamber instead. And a bariograph continuously records the air pressure. So here's an aneroid barometer. Okay. So it'll show us um, what, is the, um, what is the current barometric pressure. And here's a um, bariograph. So it's at constantly recording the, um, the atmospheric pressure. Wind is the horizontal movement of air. Out of air, air moves from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure, and that movement is wind. Controls of wind is the pressure gradient force. So with isobars, which are lines of equal air pressure. So we see in topographic maps, the lines on topographic maps are lines of equal elevation. Well, isobars are just lines of equal air pressure. Okay? Now, pressure gradient is a pressure change over distance. So the closer those isobar lines are together, the steeper that gradient is. Okay, so here's a weather map showing isobars. Okay, so here, when the lines are far apart, there's a very shallow gradient. Not, you know, if there's any wind, it's very slow. Here, actually, there's no wind. You use this chart, you see how the arrows go from very light winds to very heavy winds in their symbology. So the heavier, heavier winds are where the isobars are close together. Controls of wind. The Coriolis effect is the apparent deflection in wind direction due to Earth's rotation. So as the Earth rotates, it's deflecting the wind, and the northern hemisphere is deflected to the right, and the southern hemisphere is to the left. Friction is the only important is only important near the surface. Okay? Friction of the wind against the ground acts to slow air's movement. So the Coriolis effect. So if the Earth was not rotating, okay, and wind is traveling from here to here, we wouldn't see it deflected at all. But since the Earth is rotating, we see that the air gets deflected to the right. Okay. Upper air winds generally blow parallel to the isobars. These are called geostrophic winds. The common one that you you may hear of in, in the news times, especially in the winter, is a jet stream. It's a river of air, very high altitude, moves very fast, 120, 240 kilometers per hour. Okay, so up here, geostrophic air, so here's a pressure gradient, here's some lines. Um, so the air moves in this direction, but as it's traveling, now the Earth is rotating. So you have a little bit of Coriolis effect. So the actual wind direction is going to be in between the pressure gradient and the Coriolis effect. Okay, so if we're looking at the upper level winds. The difference between upper level winds and surface winds is that we have friction when we get down close to the ground. Okay, so here the pressure gradient is this direction, and the coil effect is 180 degrees opposite. The wind's going to move at 90 degrees. Okay, but you add friction, so we have a pressure gradient, coil is for, for uh, effect and friction, so the wind, um, the, the angle of the wind's going to be a little different than the angle of the wind, the direction of the wind high above. Okay. So here, showing a ridge and a trough. Okay, so here we have um, high pressure system. So we have the higher, higher values. And over here, our trough, low pressure, and the lines a little closer together. You see some fairly, fairly fast winds over here. Okay, so high pressure and low pressure, and a rippling of the pressure surface here. So now cyclones and anti-soak cyclones. Okay, um, the cyclone there's a center, it's a storm at the center of low pressure and the pressure decreases towards the center. The winds associated with the cyclone in the northern hemisphere, the winds come inwards so and converge and travel counterclockwise. The southern hemisphere, the winds converge inward but travel clockwise. This is the Coriolis effect. 
is associated with a, high, a rising air, often brings clouds and precipitation. An anticyclone has a high pressure center, pressure increases towards the center. Um, the air, though, moves outwards and diverges and travels clockwise. In the southern hemisphere, the air moves outwards, but it travels counterclockwise. This is associated with sinking air, subsiding air. So high pressure systems usually bring fair weather, nice weather. Okay, so here is our, our cyclone, the converging air towards the low pressure, or the, and it's going to bring clouds and rain possibly. Up here we have our high pressure with the clouds, so the wind is diverging, traveling outwards, and we'll probably have some fairly good, good weather there. Okay, so high above we have our, our geostrophic winds, okay. Oh, when it casts over the high pressure, the air is going to want to subside and cycle around, our anticyclonic flow. As um, um, uh, when the air passes over the low pressure, there's rising air. It's going to diverge those, you know, push apart the winds. Okay, so it's rising up. Okay. General atmospheric circulation. The underlying cause is unequal surface heating. On the rotating Earth, there are three pairs of atmospheric cells that redistribute the heat. The okay. reason why unequal surface heating is well, water, a lot of the surface of the Earth is water, and that, when water cools slower and heats slower than, than land surface. So all the continents are going to heat more and faster, and they're going to cool more and faster. So it causes uneven, unequal surface heating, so that's going to cause some atmospheric circulation. And we have these three pairs of atmospheric cells that redistribute this heat. So idealized globalized circulation, we have a, a low pressure zone at the equator, rising air with lots of precipitation. The air is nice and hot, it rises, gets to point, dew point, it starts dropping all its precipitation, and that's when I want to start sinking in the subtropical high pressure zone, subsiding stable dry air, as the air already dropped its, its moisture, at near 30 degrees latitude, that's a location of our great deserts. Air traveling equatorward from the subtropical high produces trade winds, and air traveling poleward from the subtropical high produces the westerly winds. Okay. Our subpolar uh, low pressure zone is warm and cool winds interact. A polar front is also an area of storms. Um, a polar high pressure zone is cool, cold subsiding air. Air spreads equatorward and produces easterly winds, and polar easterlies collide with the westerlies along the polar front. Okay. So, here we have our equatorial low, so that war air warms up, so a, lot of, a lot of sun radiation heating up, heating up the air, it's going to want to rise, as it rises it will cool and drop all its precipitation, okay, and then the air is going to follow the pressure gradient um, on this way and it's going to be sinking, okay, and so here we have, here's we have our, our um, trade winds and our westerly winds um, being formed, so here's our well, here's our southeast trade winds. Up here's our northeast trade winds. Up here, this side of the Hadley cell, we have our westerly winds. Up here, we have our polar easterly uh, winds, the polar front. In the winter time, this polar front comes down over the United States. There's some nice uh, winter weather. Uh, this past winter, the polar front went really far south. We're calling it the polar vortex. Influence of continents. Seasonal temperature differences disrupt the global pressure patterns and wind pressure. The influence is most obvious in the northern hemisphere, and that's because all, most of the land is in the northern hemisphere, and we have differential heating and cooling. It's going to cause some disruption to that generalized atmospheric circulation. We just looked at it. So the uh, monsoon is a seasonal change in wind direction. Okay, so here we have this global map, and here it, and this one is winter, and here we have a lot of the air moving off the continents. To over, you know, so off over over Asia across India, this is going to be very dry air. Okay, so they're not going to have a monsoonal season here. Okay, but then in the summer, the air is warm, moist air is coming off the ocean and hitting the land mass, dropping its precipitation on India. So that's why having such um, vast monsoons in their area. Here, a closer look. Here's the winter. We have this dry air coming off the continent. There's no rain. Okay, we have dry air coming off the continent here, so we don't have as much rain in Florida. And come summer, the air is coming up off the ocean, moist and warm. And as it cools over the land, it's going to want to drop in, um, drop in that rainfall. The air, same thing, or with our monsoons, we have the air coming off the ocean. We want to drop its rainfall on 
on the land. So a monsoon occurs over continents during warm months. Air flows onto land, warm moist air from the ocean. The winter months, air flows off the land, dry continental air. Okay, in the mid-latitude, so a little bit north of, of us in Florida, there's a zone of westerlies, complex, air flow is interrupted by cyclones. So the cells move west to east in the northern hemisphere and follow a jet stream. They create anticyclonic and cyclonic flow. Paths of the cyclones and anticyclones are associated with upper level airflow. So sometimes the jet stream is one controller of the pathways of these cyclones, anticyclones. Local winds are produced from temperature differences. There's small scale winds. We may some examples are land and sea breezes, mountain and valley breezes, and Chinook and Santa Ana winds. Okay. Mountain and valley breezes, let's say in the valley during the day, the air warms up, so it's going to start wanting to rise. So, so the, uh, the um, wind is going uphill, and then the mountain, cool air comes off the mountainside as that air starts to want to sink and, and cool. Um, sea breeze and land breeze, okay, sea breeze, there's warm land and cool water, okay, so the air is going to... Um, it's going to rise up the land, up from the land, and head out the sea as it subsides over the ocean. It's going to come up onto the land. Okay, so here's our sea breeze. So most of the breeze is going to be heading from water to land. And then at night, when it cools over the land, the breeze is going to switch directions. It's going to go from the land out to the water. Two basic measurements for wind is the direction and the speed. The winds are labeled from, from where they originate. So the wind is coming from the north, we call the north wind. It's going from north to south. Instrument for measuring wind direction is a wind vane. Uh, direction is indicated either by compass points, north, northeast, south, or by scale of 0 to 360 degrees. The prevailing wind comes more often from one direction. We have a prevailing wind. Speed often measured with a cup anemometer. Okay, so changes in wind direction associated with locations of cyclones and anticyclones often bring in changes in temperature and moisture conditions. So here we have, we, here's like weather, sock weather vane. So we know the wind is, is coming from here and it's going, going this way. Here we have a cup anemometer. This would spin. The fa it spins faster the, the faster the wind is. This wind vane will rotate to show which direction the wind is coming from. Here's the uh, same thing. This is this will spin for speed, and it will rotate the direction the wind is coming from. And um, these uh, these windmills were like energy producing windmills there. To ger generate uh, energy from wind, there's certain areas in the United States where there's more potential. In the red zones, there's higher potential for for wind. The uh, kind of dark orange, uh, good potential for wind, and yellow, moderate potential for developing uh, wind 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 farms. El Nino and La Nina. El Nino is a countercurrent that flows southward along the coasts of Ecuador and Peru. This is warm, it usually appears during the Christmas season, and blocks upwelling of colder, nutrient filled water, and the anchovy starve from lack of food. The strongest El Nino events on record occur between 1982 and 1983, and 1997 and 1998. The 1997 98 event caused heavy rains in Ecuador and Peru. Ferocious storms in California. It's related to large scale atmospheric circulation. Pressure change between easterly and the western Pacific called the Southern Oscillation. Changes in trade winds create a major change in the equatorial current system with warm water flowing eastward. Okay, so here the strong equatorial current in normal conditions. Warm water is flowing this way. So the cool water is upwelling and traveling this way, bringing lots of nutrients up from the bottom. The anchovies thrive. So then uh, fishing, fishing is good. We've got nice fair weather hitting the west coast of the United States. So it's a good normal condition. But during El Nino, there's a strong countercurrent of warm water. It's preventing the cool water from rising, therefore cutting off nutrients to the anchovies so they don't, they don't survive. We end up with heavy rains and flooding in Ecuador and Peru. We could have extra, extra wet weather in Oregon, western Washington, Oregon, and California. That's where Florida, this is when in Florida we have a cooler, wetter winters uh, when we have an El Nino. The effects are highly variable depending on part, part on the temperatures and size of the warm water pools. 
La Nina is the opposite of El Nino, triggered by colder than average surface temperatures in the eastern Pacific. Typical La Nina winter blows colder than normal air over the Pacific Northwest, blowing the Great Plains, while warming much of the rest of the United States. Greater precipitation expected in the Northwest. The events associated with El Nino and La Nina are now understood to have significant influence on the state of weather and climate almost everywhere. Global distribution of precipitation. It's a relatively complex pattern related to global wind and pressure patterns. High pressure regions have subsiding air, divergent winds, and dry conditions, i.e. the uh, Sahara and Kalahari deserts along uh, 30 um, degrees latitude. Uh, low pressure regions have ascending air, converging winds, lots of precipitation. So, so over the Amazon and Congo, very equatorial areas. Okay, so here um, we have the Amazon Congo, we have lots of rainfall. Okay? Yet uh, up here we have very arid, very little rainfall. Okay, so interesting uh, um, temperature pattern. We have more rainfall in the southeastern United States than we do out in the, the Midwest. This is also um, related to the distribution of land and water. Large land masses in the middle of the la and middle latitudes often have less precipitation towards their centers. Mountain barriers also alter precipitation patterns. Windward slopes receive abundant rainfall from orographic lifting. Leeward slopes are usually deficient in moisture, forming the rain shadow.